All right, so for something a little different, I figured I would do a sort of behind the scenes of a recent live streaming gig that I was a part of. Now, this was done for the Philippine Nurses Association of New Jersey, and this was essentially a full day live stream of an educational conference, something that would typically be done in person, but in this case was done to a partially in-person audience, but the vast majority, I would say between 100 and 200 people uh, attending remotely via Zoom. Now, I did this with another company and was essentially brought on as the subject matter expert in terms of the technical and streaming aspects. While I consider myself to be sort of a jack-of-all-trades videographer, I do work in the IT field full-time, and so I do have some pretty regular experience with streaming platforms and just video conferencing software like Zoom. Now, for this particular event, it's worth noting that we did this actually in the Nurses Association's building, which they own and maintain. In this case, there was a large sort of breakout room that they had, which about half was split into an actual set portion where the hosts, the panelists, and everything would be set up, and then sort of the other latter half where an audience would be participated, and then a separate section where those actually helping run the event and manage some of the technical aspects would be situated. Now, I actually had an opportunity to attend sort of an in-person dress rehearsal the week before, they had, I would say, a decent majority of the portion of the set and the placement of things figured out. But even though I had only brought a minimal camera rig with me to that dress rehearsal, this allowed me to start considering camera blocking elements and where I would place things and just how the general arrangement of the day would go. Now for this event, I ended up just using two cameras. This was my Sony a7S III, which was essentially camera A on a 24-70 G Master lens. Pretty much focused on the hosting area, where you'd have a couple of hosts regularly talking behind a backdrop, and also serving double duty to cover a podium and lectern area where different speakers would be presenting. Now camera B was my a7 III on a 70-200 G Master lens, which would be used to essentially do tighter shots of a panel. There was a long table where a few panelists would be seated throughout the event and could also serve double duty and cover that sort of lectern area as well if and when needed. Now both cameras went via HDMI, outputting 1080p 30 frames a second into my Blackmagic ATEM Television Studio HD. And the Television Studio HD has really been an important aspect of my live streaming gigs over the past year or so, though it was obviously underutilized I'd say in this case with just a couple cameras going into it. There's been cases where we've gone into an event thinking we need three or four different inputs only to find we need five or six. And having the ability to do longer runs with cameras through SDI inputs also just makes this a really flexible unit for doing a lot of live streaming gigs. Now from there, the Television Studio HD actually went into my Camlink 4K capture card and went directly into my laptop directly going into Zoom. I found generally that with Zoom taking any higher quality feeds and going directly in, rather than through any separate encoder or transcoder is probably a better route to go. Though, as with most of these video conferencing platforms, if and when you're not doing or able to do an RTMP stream, you're pretty much at the mercy of these platforms in terms of how they encode things and how they compress things, what codecs they use to actually stream, and that can make things interesting to an extent, which I'll talk about a bit later. Now, in terms of the audio setup for this gig, the person I was working with from this company actually pretty much ended up taking on most of the audio setup themselves. In this case, this was essentially a Mackie DL1608 mixer, which captured a bunch of microphones for the panelists, that lectern area, and the hosts going directly into it, mostly with the ability for him to mix and master audio as the day went on and adjust levels as needed. In this case, the actual output from the mixer went into a couple of places. The main outputs went into just a couple of powered speakers scattered throughout that main set area. And in this case, the auxiliary outputs from the mixer went directly into my ATEM Television Studio HD through its XLR inputs. I found that certainly different mixers are going to output different levels in terms of a line output, whether that's a minus 10 or a plus four line level output. So you may have to sometimes play around with in terms of what output routing from that mixer works best with the ATEM and our boost level on the XLR inputs to get a little bit higher level from the audio, which I needed to do in this case as well. A couple of other points of the setup to consider. You'll notice that there was a projector and a projector screen, which we ended up using to essentially output the Zoom meeting and that main screen for those on set so that they could use as a quasi-confidence monitor and just track the general actual presentation of what was being shown to participants in the event. You can usually do this in a couple ways. One I've done before is to just take my laptop, split the desktops between my main laptop screen and the projector screen and throw the zoom window on the projector window. Now the other option is to just mirror your display so that what you're outputting externally to the projector 
is what you're showing on your laptop. I'm gonna use the other person's laptop from this company to output that zoom to the projector in this case. Now in terms of matching cameras, looks, and the general picture profiles, the a7S III and the a7 III can match pretty adequately well, so long as you know how to tweak and adjust picture profiles correspondingly. In this case, I use the movie gamma on both of them, with only slight tweaks to detail and color phase as necessary to get out the magenta and green skews. Some of these cameras might have the different degrees. These are usually the aspects of picture profiles I would change anyway. Now generally I like the movie or standard Sony gamma a lot. My biggest complaint would probably be in the realm of the super whites, i.e. the 100 to 109 IRE area, where it just tends to be very bright and you lose a bit of dynamic range. In this case, we were in a pretty controlled environment, and so we didn't have to contend with any blown out areas of the image, so this worked pretty well. Though another interesting match is to actually use a Cinetone on the a7S III, and Paul Ream or Extra Shots, a uh, variant of sort of a Cine 4 and Pro gamma and color gamut, which I found also matches pretty well. I might link to that below. Now for the internet connection situation, this was sort of a tale of two halves. This is maybe worth its own little discussion here. This was a day-long event, and roughly went about eight hours or so. And while we initially tried to hook up to the main router in the building and do a wired connection, which is pretty much always going to be your best bet, what we found is given the number of people in the building, which was about 50 or 60, and just the general strain that was on the router in the building, pretty much connections were consistently dropping and people were getting kicked off as the router would try to handle way too many people connecting to it. We also didn't have the ability to go into the router and start assigning static IPs to certain devices and are blocking people from not being able to use it. So this was a battle we weren't going to be able to win. This was essentially a consumer router that your ISP would give you for your house and it was just way too much for it to handle. And we had done other events with this group and in this building before, though at that time, particularly during 2020, the only people in the building were those actually doing and a part of the virtual event because there was this in-person audience and some other folks stationed in a conference room nearby watching. This almost tripled or quadrupled the number of people that were in the building. Now, of course, ignoring Wi-Fi purely, which would have been from the same router source, we did have our fair share of 4G and kind of tethered connection options. And these worked, though maybe to an extent. This is where the tale of two halves comes into play. Specifically, what we found was essentially any time we would do cuts to different cameras, this was a pretty jarring change that Zoom had trouble handling with regard to the connection it was utilizing. And so we'd get some variant of what's typically called like the confetti effect, where for a few seconds or so you'd get a lossy or laggy image and or audio quality before things cleared back up. Now again, even though this cleared up within a few seconds, this became obvious to participants and some folks would complain in the chat and made us aware of it. So this was something we realized we'd have to sort of mitigate and work around, particularly within the second half of the event. In this case, the main way around it was just to sort of have less changes going on in the frame with what we were streaming. For instance, rather than doing direct cuts of the panel from individual to individual to individual, doing a wide shot of the panel as people were going back and forth discussing topics would be a much less jarring change and something that Zoom could handle better in this case. Also similarly for Q&A sessions where we'd be doing cuts typically from the host area back to the panel, and back and forth with this, we could actually just position the host in front of the panel and use just one general wide shot to cover most of that as well. And this pretty much largely worked to the extent that we could mitigate any of the connection issues, or certainly if we came across in areas when we noticed a connection getting a little bit weird, we could accommodate it that way. Though I've been contemplating doing something like a one or two U rack unit with the ATAM Television Studio HD, and maybe something like a HyperDeck Mini, I'm still waiting to see if and how much I end up utilizing a lot of this stuff post-2020, well throughout 2021, and just seeing if and how live streaming gigs pan out in the near future. And since I mentioned the HyperDeck Mini, I'll talk a bit about recording. It is imperative to make sure that in some way, shape, or form you're recording these events uh, for just general purpose and use after the fact. Of course, Zoom can record in this case as well, either locally or through the cloud. I initiated a cloud recording in this case, even though I sometimes prefer local recordings because they tend to be of a bit higher quality and they can show exactly what you intend to represent in terms of the amount of PowerPoint display or the amount of participant and how you control that on your own Zoom window. Because of some of the internet connection issues we were aware of very early on, it just made sense to do a cloud recording so that no single person was going to be a point of failure in terms of the Zoom recording completing. Now from the recording perspective of what went into the switcher, I've also used things like OBS and or even QuickTime to just do simple recordings off of that. OBS tends to be a bit better overall. QuickTime can work, 
Though, if you use the maximum quality option for QuickTime, bear in mind that that's recording ProRes 422, and that can be quite a strain on your computer over time, and or cause things to get crashy if you're intending to run that for hours on end. And just as a general point of note, you'll notice that for this event, we had multiple people stationed there, some of which were actually part of the Nurses Association, some of which were part of the company I was for, it's really important to have a bunch of different hands when you have events of this size and scope, just simply because you as one person generally can't do it. I've done single camera streams myself, and it's been workable to an extent, but it always is helpful when you're able to delineate sort of responsibilities across different people and say, so in this case, we didn't have to worry about running content in terms of different PowerPoints or playing different videos or even controlling what participants could enter the Zoom and ensuring that those folks were registered for the event. That was something that the event organizers and those as part of the Nurses Association could handle themselves. And so that's a run through of a live streaming gig. Hopefully this little behind the scenes has been informative and helpful in some way. I'm certainly hoping to do more with different types of gigs as they come up and as I'm able to capture some behind the scenes footage for things. Definitely let me know if this was of interest to you or if other content related to live streaming would be of interest. I'm hoping to cover more of these in the future. That is all I have to say, so thanks for watching. Thank you.